All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Tabor Talks. We have been away for a while, but I am joined by my newest partner in cybercrime, none other than Mr. Clayton Rhinesse. How are you doing, Clayton? Welcome to Tabor Talks, officially your first episode. That's right. Yes, great to be here. Thank you, Cash. Uh, I think we're going to be a dynamic duo here going forward, so looking forward to that. <laughs> a dynamic duo fighting uh, cybercrime one incident at a time but recently i actually got on a double incident on one call which was a personal record for me so that was fun yeah so <laughs> two maybe. calls two ears uh, you can handle it right yeah you can handle it not a big deal but uh we've definitely been in the world of cyber threats and cyber crime recently there's been an uptick of course a lot of major stuff in the news so for our listeners out there we did take some time off cyber threats were lurking in the air right um so you know who are you gonna call tavora time crime fighters but we're back we're here to share some good new information with you all um with that i know clayton you brought a couple cool stories to my attention and of course we did want to highlight the big ticket here um you know we have of course the crowd strike windows issue you know you wanted to talk about that there was the big data breach recently on at and we wanted to dive in and there was another one that you kind of mentioned um that you wanted to highlight yeah well, there was the, the, buck to you. the no before uh issue and i got a bonus one too if we want to tackle that one at the end but that that's what really piqued my interest is uh is the, are those two so let's just let's just dive into it uh where do you want to start where do you want to go with you want to start with the hottest one the least hottest one i mean they're all kind of pretty big and <laughs> no they're all good i think I think the no before one, let, yeah, let's just dive in it. I love this one because it's uh, there's sort of an AI angle as well. So no before they do cybersecurity training primarily around phishing and phishing prevention. That's mostly training content, various languages, localities, all that. Uh, interestingly, they actually hired, inadvertently hired a North Korean spy. Uh, and this is great because he was, uh, he, was, he was signed on as a principal software engineer. So they used a stolen, he used a stolen identity it's a fake photo, and even in the interview process where he was doing Zoom calls or some, you know, uh, interview, he had some AI generated imagery for his persona that he had taken on. Right, <laughs> it's wow. pretty wild, right? So he got through. He got through HR, and they got him. They got this guy hired on. Pretty wild. That is uh, wild. That even AI right now is taking insider threats to the next level, right? Oh, geez. And you Man, always think like, oh, who's really going to clone this guy's face? And But it was enough to fool HR and do multiple rounds of interviews, which is pretty cool. I mean, we know the voice cloning can be done pretty easily, but the video, that's always a that, that's a much higher bar, I always think. Well, I mean, I have seen like, you know, some of these new uh, influencers, right, where they're using a lot of video generated AI, like real time rendering to enhance their image because of, you know, of course, Hurting the cells right online. So yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that, but I haven't really seen it used in this context. But that makes it that makes it scary, right? You know, for a lot of yeah. companies nowadays that are like full remote, what you're doing your due diligence, but how do you how that's do you a trick? Yeah. Thing. It's uh it is trick. Well, he was pretty sophisticated too. I mean, they had a phony address, so they sent like a laptop to this phony address, and then it was someone just fencing this or a mule farm essentially for these laptops that are like faux employees and then sending it off to North Korea where this guy was located. And that's actually how they found him. Hat tip to the OPSEC people who found out, but he immediately got the laptop logged in and started loading, you know, uh, information gathering software on the endpoint that they had issued to him. And that's actually how they found him. And they, they saw these weird activity and said, hey, what's going on here? This isn't right. Uh, so it's definitely a win for the for the SOC operators, but pretty crazy that they sent this laptop domestically it made its way through intermediaries to north korea and then uh and then started out you know he started doing his nefarious deeds did they in their report that you read did they kind of identify or highlight any particular alerts or the type of activity were they using like edr to track it was it yeah their, their edr 
it's I think it is in the in the article which we'll post in the show notes that they were using an EDR and their SOC was seeing alerts for information gathering malware that was being put or attempted to be put on the endpoint. That's interesting. I mean, the amount of trouble and the you know scale that they've done to get in the environment. It's a simple factor they overlooked from you know is there yeah no doubt. yeah that's pretty that's I pretty elaborate like I mean anytime you got AI video I think that's a pretty that's a pretty elaborate ruse to get on and I interesting I don't know what they were targeting necessarily I mean obviously they've got proprietary stuff but most of what I've been able to see and you and you know know before is a good partner of ours as well is it's a lot of training material so I mean okay you want someone's videos I, I don't know quite what the angle is necessarily but certainly a kind of a scary scenario there for them yeah i think maybe you know you know before right if i understand it, they they can build any kind of customized learning modules for your company right so maybe through that they're sometimes putting in proprietary knowledge in their training so you yeah. never know definitely proprietary stuff but so that's why that makes me think of this one incident that I was on where one of our clients called us and said, hey, you know, we had this employee we hired. They showed up, they got the stuff, and then they disappeared. And then all of a sudden, we know after like a week, we couldn't find them. We went to their house trying to see who this person is. The person who opened the door was the person we hired on paper, but not the face. And then magically, a couple of days later, the laptop just literally shows up on our company doorstep and they called us to do some forensics. And I'm like, hey, I don't know what this is. There's nothing on this device. Right. So kind of in the same realm. Yeah. But insider threats. They're they're crazy. Right. Definitely crazy. What's interesting, too, is they threw out a recommendation here. They said you should put all new hires in, so in a sandbox and not give them access to source code or other proprietary information initially, which I don't know, sounds great. I don't know how practical that would be. If you hire someone for a job, you need to get them involved in, in, in what they're supposed to be doing very quickly. And even if, if you're this guy and you're going to these lengths to be able to fake an interview, I'm sure you can wait your 30, 90 days or whatever it's going to be for your sandbox period to expire. But I think they're really just stressing, hey, you should have caution before you trust people and trust new hires uh, with, with your proprietary information. Yeah, totally. It kind of goes uh, with that age old saying, trust, but verify. Trust, <laughs> kind of <verify>. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, to your point, I mean, yeah, if this guy knows that I'm in the 60 or 90 day holding period, okay, I just got to write out the attack, right? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we know just, you know, targeted attacks, you know, these threat actors live off the land. They can kind of be hiding in, in the environment for X number of days, months, et cetera. Um, so, Yes, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. That's definitely a tough one. I think we got to kind of maybe even regress to in-person interviews only. I don't know. A um, little yeah, bit easier awesome. said than done. So. Don't know that I have. We, I don't know that we have a good fix for the uh, faked video interview, but yeah, in-person would certainly help. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you even do to identify that a video is being rendered live with a filter? And you know, I don't know. Yeah, somebody I'm sure is working on a uh, working a. Uh, mechanism as we speak hopefully if they're not our listeners somebody jump on it you'll be, you'll be a millionaire overnight so but that said um there's still a lot more that was just the tip of the iceberg right i know we have another couple big ones at t yeah. you heard about at t's kind of breach a lot of audio recordings were out there i didn't really follow up on it to see if there was anything specific that was leaked that was more harmful did they target anybody but nonetheless, that's that's a crazy kind of thing too, right? I think if I read it correctly, something along of you know five six months of audio recordings or call recordings or call logs were available to these to these attackers, which kind of makes you think, you know, what what is the protocol on the back end for these service providers, right? These telecom providers, do they have to retain this much information? Now it kind of got my brain going. It's like how much of my call history, call logs, recordings are in somebody else's data that I just never knew about? Yeah, no question. Right? Yeah, it's I, mean, tons. I mean, it's they're, they're talking about millions of customers and call data, right? And then also millions of employees, current and former at t employees. That's pretty great. I mean, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of 
uh, telemetry on who's calling whom and for how long. And I don't even know if there's uh, geolocation information in there. It's a little bit unclear, but uh, definitely personally identifiable information on 73 million plus current and former AT&T account holders part of that data breach. Yeah, and here I'm just kind of skimming the report of my notes. It's like the data belongs to an earlier set. Here it's saying appears to be from 2019 or earlier, which in itself is kind of crazy, right? Because we're in 2024. That means AT&T has data sets for all these records extending four or five years or whatever it is. So that's one. But then they're saying impacting approximately 7.6 million current AT&T account holders and approximately 65.4 million former account holders. That's a lot. That's a big, that's a wow. big uh, speech, right? Mm -hmm. um, but hey, I'm where do you figured, oh, I figured, I think, data? Oh, I know. Yeah, no, no it, I think you, that is an important issue. I mean, I don't know why they would be retaining that all history for that long. I'm sure there's maybe some regulatory reason why, maybe legal reason why, but I mean, not best practices normally are, if you don't need to hold it for any legal reason, you should probably get rid of it. Some of those, some of that data can, can hurt you as much as it helps you. So the tendency to hoard data, we normally advise against, uh, but interesting that they did have tons of records from six plus years ago. And let's see, I think, you know, the mystery is still unraveling. I know the FBI is kind of uh, involved now there because, of course, it impacted so many people, right? When it gets that big, um, they'll step in. So let's see how that kind of unravels. But just to keep the news hot and flowing, the biggest one of the past couple of weeks that has been reported or in, you know, the world of Internet history, it's probably the biggest affecting glitch i don't it's not really a hack right they kind of we talk about the just attacked the entire world themselves accidentally so you know what i'm talking about crowd strike man oh the crowd strike yeah. <laughs> so yes crowd strike i mean it's been covered a lot obviously it caused a lot of outage what kind of irked me initially is everyone thought it was a microsoft problem of course those in tech and infosec know it's not a microsoft problem not a windows problem it was this it was basically a crowdstrike agent uh update that was pushed uh interesting that it was pushed out to everybody and everyone's thinking you are a huge company you have a very robust cicd pipeline and devsecops operation i would imagine this would have been tested in something pre-production i mean people were razzing pretty good my take is I, I think it's probably well deserved. They they, they should have done some QA on, on on knowing that how widespread this this problem could could be. It it would seem that it would be easy to detect as well. I mean, obviously it's a it's a blue screen requiring recovery. If you're running BitLocker, a BitLocker recovery uh, scenario as well. So I, I don't know what happened or if they've done a full postmortem just yet. They're just basically saying, hey, sorry that happened. We're gonna we're gonna do better, which is the right response, but I don't know that it fully explains what happened. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely pretty harrowing 48 hours there. And I know some folks are even still affected by that. Oh, yeah. I, I know like uh, one of the major airliners is still trying to recover. And I, I read into the full research article of exactly what happened. And it, it came down to a, not even like maybe X number of characters, one line code in C++ and no pointer dereferenced incorrectly but it, it kind of comes down to a couple things right you know what's your qa process on rolling out an update um putting c plus plus code into just a general check you know some kind of analyzer would at least mm -hmm. call that out right but it's crazy how such a small little thing can damage everybody globally which is yeah, just amazing and you know, we've we've seen these downstream effects from these providers um, through the years. Uh, one of the bigger ones that we dealt with a few years back was um, uh, who was it? Um, say big I know Okta a couple years ago, right? That was an issue with Okta. Before them was the bigger one that affected a lot of people. I can't I'm blanking on who it was. It was. Uh, it was the bigger of the downstreams. It'll come back to me. But nonetheless, right, what's our level of faith in all these 
service providers right now, especially since the world has shifted to cloud. There's a lot of SaaS services available and and whatnot. It's like yeah. we have to put our full faith and trust in these vendors that we're actually using to help protect our systems. But this was just like a one-off fluke, but it really crumbled a lot of people out there for it. And I'm, I'm sure CrowdStrike may feel the heat from it for some time. Um, I hope not, because I have some of their stock. So, uh, <laughs> as do I. And I, I, I'm, we are a huge uh, CrowdStrike fan. We love we actually deploy their tool. Yeah, um, I love CrowdStrike. Just, we don't have a problem with CrowdStrike. We love their stuff. We need them to sur- survive and and be successful. So, uh, yeah, I'm not throwing any shade there, but yeah, certainly. No. It would be good to, uh, to sort of know exactly what happened, but I did. Yeah, I think you're right. It do, it does sort of put in clear focus vendor consolidation on on key, particularly security vendors. On you know just vendor concentrate. Everyone's using it, and even places yeah. where you wouldn't suspect necessarily that they were using it or have internet connected hosts. Uh, certainly had this lo- had these agents running, had Falcon hosts running, and was get, getting updates in real time. Um, and it kind of goes beyond. It's like, you know, you can make the claim of, you know, what's your vendor validation process? But I mean, come on, it's CrowdStrike, right? Even right. If you were, this is always you know, the like, hey, we're compliant. I mean, they've got their SOC 2s. They run their ISO 27001. I'm sure it's yeah, all exactly. buttoned up. And, they're but all they're buttoned still... up to speed. It's just like a one little minor mistake, literally. It's like on, on the scheme of how big the code block is, it's literally one little minor mistake right yeah. but it led to a whole disaster so and they they did jump on it and fix it right away but of course if you're blue screening you couldn't get to the point where you're pulling the new update so i think what it highlighted for me too was like where's your bcdr a lot of folks should have been able to roll back pretty easily uh especially if you're cloud-based or have other platforms that uh are virtual you should be able to get some sort of snapshot and go back six hours four hours on your code base i don't know it I think people were more unprepared than I think they probably should be. If to me, it felt like the Y two K that we never got right, the major outage, causing all kinds of mayhem. But then, it should have been a pretty straightforward recovery. I don't know. I think if, for me, if if your organization was adversely affected, uh, for a prolonged period of time, you may want to take a close look at your BCDR program and process and see what we can do to shore that up. Because if it's just CrowdStrike today, it could be ransomware tomorrow. That's sort of the same MO. You'll be denied usage of your devices. You've got to be able to know how badly that can be for you. No, great point, right? BCDR, it can come in any way, right? It could be a disaster. It could be something like this. But, um. You know, having the plan in place and, you know, I go through a lot of these uh, trainings and modules too for tabletops. Having the plan documented is one chunk of it. Test it, right? Does your plan yeah. actually work? Have you guys ever tried to intentionally swap over to your failover mechanism on critical systems? A lot of times they really haven't, um, surprisingly. But not, I wouldn't say surprising, right? Because it's, yeah, it's a lot, maybe not surprising. A lot yeah. easier to ask um, than actually implementing resources and swapping and of course there's that big nervous um mechanism i wouldn't want to be the guy to say okay pull the plug on production and hopefully <laughs> backup turns on so no doubt hopefully the failover works charlie but um yeah I don't know. It's, it's, it's wild but nonetheless stay vigilant right i guess that's the best thing. yeah no doubt uh but with that, um, to our Tabora Talks listeners, I hope you enjoyed us coming back. You know, we're kind of midway of 2024. Lots definitely happened this year, but our goal, uh, our goal here is to get back on it, bring you guys some highlights and fun stuff, and we'll definitely maybe bring back some, um, you know, hacker history and different old school hacks, fun things that we can talk about. And I know Black Hat's right around the corner, too. We'll bring you some highlights there. But on this end of it for this week, for our first Hoorah Back, it's been good to talk to you all. Mr. Ryness, it's great to have you here on the show as my official new partner in cybercrime. And uh, for the rest of you guys, keep listening in. That's all I got to say. Any final words for our fabulous audience? 
No, it's been great. We'll keep it going. Thank you, Cash. Thank you, sir. Keep it going. And until next time, Tavora out.